Current release for you is 09, right? Yeah, we're actually uh, almost done with the 09s, moving into 2010. Okay, so now we're going to uh, go with the 2009 Walla Walla Syrah. So um, this is all Walla Walla fruit. Are you producing Syrahs that aren't falling under the Walla Walla dap, uh, appellation? Yeah, so you'll okay. see the next one we do is um, is uh, Columbia Valley. Columbia Valley, and, okay. Um, yeah, so Columbia Valley is actually a really, really big um, AVA, but we use Columbia Valley more so. That's our kind of northern Washington area, mm -hmm. and, and the Syrah we get from Walla Walla, we usually label Syrah. So. And um, I guess nuanced differently in what ways? Do you, I mean, are you uh, trying to just show more terroir with the Walla Walla? No, um, you know, actually, we, um, the Walla Walla wine tends to be a little riper. Okay. Um, and um, just because it's a little warmer in Walla Walla than it is up in, up in Yakima, or at least the vineyards that, that we work with. Um, but what I'm trying to, you know, this for me, it, it, it's, it's more of that coat roti style where it's, it's, it's smoked meat, a little riper, a little, little more generous, a little, little less acid. Um, this wine has a tiny bit of new oak on it. Okay. Um, but uh, with the Walla Walla wine, it's based off of Lake Colleen Vineyard, which is the vineyard that um, Norm McKibben from Pepperidge Winery introduced me to. Okay. And starting in um, 2008, we started adding a little bit of rocks fruit just because it, uh, we really, really like that smoked meat um, kind of nuance that the Roxford brings. Okay, cool. All right, let's give this guy a roll. Okay. Um, I think that just you know just from my take on it you get a little bit more of that um, herbal a little smokier and I do get you know that kind of that gamey note that you're talking about with with some of the Syrah kind of like a like a pepper jerky type of character what what do you typically pick yeah up? and that's and that's exactly um, what I'm looking for smoked meat um, for that herbal green thing um, and one thing we really like doing with Syrah is basically whole cluster and um, keeping the stems yeah. so basically what that means is you know we we, uh, we you don't run the wine through the crush of the stem which the grapes come out one side and the stems come out the other we actually just take the whole grape cluster make sure it's clean throw it in the, the bin and actually get in there and, and crush it with our feet because because you, you still want to crush the grapes but, but you want to retain the stems right and um, we can some some vineyards we get rid of 50 percent of the stems some vineyards will actually keep 100 percent not get rid of any of that um, and for me that gives you that that herbal thing the texture um, it gives you length, and and you know that that for me was one of the things that I that I felt that brought from the MS side. Right. Was that that you know I knew what they did classically in, in most of the regions of the world. So it's a question of saying you know you can't just say hey let's make wine exactly like they make it in Chateau of the Pop or or Cote Roti, um, but you can take bits and pieces and see how they apply it to your region. Right. Well, and I think it gives a, a a different layer of depth and and nuance to the wine with that. And you know by the by the herbal thing, it's kind of like. Um, I mean, to like an extent, like an herbs of Provence or like a thyme type of character that is, um, it's not, it's not green necessarily, but it's just, it's like savory type of a component to it. So are you, with this, are you um, doing the open top mi uh, macro bin fermentations or are you just doing like the crush with uh, your feet in those bins and then transferring it? Um, yeah, we're using mostly um, one and a half uh, to three ton open fermenters. Um, yeah, so Syrah, um, you know, really, um, what kind of was the aha moment for me uh, with Syrah was actually being in the Willamette Valley talking to Steve Dorner, who's the winemaker at Christum. And we were talking about Pinot Noir, and he had just started experimenting with some Syrah. And if you ever taste with Steve Dorner, it's always a three hour affair. It's, it's yeah. one of the greatest tastings in the world. Yeah. Um, and we started talking about stems in Pinot Noir because it's a traditional area in Burgundy. Um, and we kind of came to the conclusion after three hours of drinking his wines that Pinot, that Pinot Noir and Syrah are really, really similar. Um, and if you make it like Pinot Noir, the results are, are actually tend to, to, to work out pretty well. Um, so, you know, everything about Syrah, it's, we, we want it really gentle, we don't move it, um, pretty much don't use any pumping, um, uh, we, we punch it down very, very gently. Um, we don't rack it at all, we just leave it in the, in the barrel. So we, we want to be super, super, super gentle, and, and that's what really preserves acidity yeah, and, I, and aromatics. I can definitely see that. So are you uh, toying around with doing any Pinot Noir? Uh, no, you know, I, I would love to because obviously there's amazing sites in Willamette Valley, but but 
to get down to the Willamette Valley, when, you know, which is a four-hour drive, it's, it's a little rough. But I, yeah, I, maybe I in the future, I'd love yeah. to. Yeah. The thing that I you know, typically equate for you know, blind tastings through the MS program and things like that, you think of um, you know, Syrah-based Northern Rhone wines, or you think of uh, Barossa Valley in Australia, or you think of like Central Coast California. But this provides a whole different element that, I, that some of those don't offer. It's got extreme depth of flavor and, and really, you know, I think, I don't want to necessarily say powerful, but very rich flavors, um, but it's extremely elegant. Um, you know, the tannins are are there, but they're, they dissipate on the palate. And after taking my last sip like two minutes ago, I still have that lingering flavor on there. That's a, this one is, is singing beautifully now. What have you found? I know you know your, your first release was 2006? 2005. 2005? Yeah. Um, I know it's still young, but how are, are, are your wines aging? We've been really, really, really happy. Um, you know, and this wine, I wasn't really sure uh, how well it was going to age because the vineyard's only about um, 12 to 15 years old. Okay. Um, but I, luckily, I had had for our second wine, Columbia Valley, the two uh, vineyards that we put into that wine, I had had it back 15 years. Um, and a friend of mine, Jamie Brown, who's the winemaker at Waters, he had started with Forgotten Hills Fruit, which is one of the vineyards, you know, way, way, way back, um, you know, basically when it was first starting to, to, um, to ripen. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I knew that there was a history of, of Syrah aging well, um, but we've been really, really happy. We've been tasting the 05 and 06 of this, and, and, and you know, they're, they're still really, really, really young. Yeah, they seem like they would, I mean, easy 12, 15 years, and I mean, approachable now, but it seems like they've got the structure to be able to to really round out over time. Yeah, hmm. and you know that's always the that's always the challenge is you know how do you because the reality is, you know we want our wines to age, but a lot of consumers want their wines ready to drink the minute you. Yeah, it's them. a now consuming type of yeah. of drinking public out there. I know for sure.